Hi, my name is Dan, and this is a video about a section of Asylum Street in Hartford, Connecticut, just across from the old State House, extending west along the south side of Asylum Street is the 1929 Corning Building, which has stores on the ground floor and offices above. West of it is a parking garage erected in the early 1960s that also has stores on the ground floor. Between these two structures is an alley with a driveway and parking spaces. There's a fence there with a historic marker for Savitt Jewelers, which is one of Hartford's most fondly remembered businesses. The Savitt store was here from 1936 until it finally closed a half century later and the building was torn down. The store was founded by William Myron Savitt, known as Bill, Born in Springfield, Massachusetts to parents who had immigrated from Russia, Bill Savitt eventually relocated to Hartford, where he opened his first jewelry store on Park Street in 1919. Three years later, Savitt opened his first store on Asylum Street at number 42 Asylum. This was across the street from his later, more famous location. In 1928, his store briefly relocated to Main Street while a new building, called the Hoover Building, was built. Savitt then reopened in the Hoover Building. His store now had an address of 40 Asylum Street. He would remain there until 1936, when the business crossed the street to the larger space at 35 Asylum. At this location, where he would continue to expand over the years, customers would come to buy jewelry, watches, silver, eyeglasses, radios, and more, until the store finally closed in 1986. Everyone knew about Savitz because of Bill Savitz's genius for advertising and publicity. Known as the King of Diamonds, his adverts proclaimed that his store was 35 seconds from Maine, and he was depicted standing on his head to display his dedication to his customers. But it was a slogan he started using in the 1940s that would become the most ubiquitous, POMG, Peace of Mind Guaranteed. Honored for his philanthropy, Savitt was a great champion for the city of Hartford. He was a founder of radio station WCCC, and was a good friend of Hartford radio personality Bob Steele. Through an arrangement with the New York jeweler Harry Winston, he brought a number of famous gemstones to Hartford, most notably the Hope Diamond, which was on display at Savitt's for three days in October of 1952. Savitt also had a passion for sports, especially golf and baseball. He formed the semi-professional team called the Savitt Gems, which played in many charity exhibition games that brought some of the biggest names in baseball to Hartford. On September 30, 1945, Babe Ruth played the final ball game of his career in a Savitt Gems uniform. Bill Savitt retired in 1986 and passed away in 1995. The old Savitt store is now gone, a well-remembered part of Hartford's history. Savitt was the last and most famous of many retail establishments that occupied this spot in Hartford over the years. In the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the lost buildings and some of the long-forgotten businesses that existed here from the early 19th century into the 20th century. I'm also going to talk about buildings and businesses that used to be just east of Savitz, where the 1929 Corning Building stands today. This is a section of the bird's eye view of Hartford of 1877. The building at the corner of Maine and Asylum was called the Corning Building, erected in about 1874. It replaced an earlier commercial building on the site, erected about a half century earlier. 
The 1874 building was then itself replaced in 1929 by the new Corning building that still exists today. The new Corning building extended further west along Asylum than its predecessor, so a few other neighboring 19th century buildings were demolished to make way for it. Just west of these were the two buildings where Savitz would later be. This photograph from the late 1920s is a view west across Main Street towards the intersection with Asylum Street. On the right is the Hartford Etna Building, considered to be the city's first skyscraper. It was erected in 1912 and demolished in 1990. On the left is the 1874 Corning Building. At the time of this picture, it was about to be taken down to make way for its larger replacement. A few decades before this picture was taken, the building just west of the Corning Building was numbered 5 Asylum Street. By the early 1880s, it was occupied by Watrous the Hatter, who had been in business at several other locations downtown for the previous 20 years. In 1885, he sold his business to the Union Hat Company, which shortly thereafter changed its name to the Union Hat and Fur Company. This photo is a view west up Asylum Street. It was taken in about 1886, when 5 Asylum Street was occupied by the Union Hat and Fur Company. As their signage showed, they also specialized in trunks and bags. Just east of the store, occupying part of the 1874 Corning Building, was the entrance to the optical shop of Ernst Schall. His main operation was his jewelry store, on the Main Street side of the building. In 1892, he incorporated his business and combined his two spaces into a much larger store. Shaw was an immigrant born in 1841 in Württemberg, Germany. He came to the United States when he was 12 years old and later began business in a small store on Gold Street before moving to the Robbins Building at the corner of Main and Mulberry Streets. In 1876, he moved his store to the Corning Building, where he remained until 1902. That was the year of his final move to 941 Main Street, opposite Brown, Thompson & Company. He passed away four years later. Moving now to the buildings on the other side of the Union Hat and Fur Company, the store just west was occupied from 1878 to 1889 by Henry Cohn Jewelers. In 1892, Cohn would move into a building on Main Street that would eventually be taken over by Sage Allen and Company. Just west of Cohn's was the building at 23 Asylum Street. In the late 1870s, it was occupied by R.P. Kenyon and Company, whose advertisements indicated that they were just around the corner and were the second hat store west of Maine. They were the only wholesale hat and fur house in Connecticut at the time. They occupied all the floors of the building. Three of those floors were devoted to their wholesale goods, samples of which were sold by traveling salesmen who operated in Connecticut, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and northern New York State. As was noted in the Hartford Current newspaper on November 6, 1878, quote, the manufacture of fine furs, seal sacks, silk circulars, etc., we find to be the specialty of the season, and the large number of persons purchasing these costly garments is a wonder in these hard times. Some 25 girls find constant employment in their manufacture, and for weeks past are obliged to work evenings to keep up with orders." Unquote. 
The company moved into the Hills Block on Main Street in 1880. The ground floor space at 23 Asylum Street was then taken over in 1881 by A. P. Weeks, who opened Weeks Brothers Morning Goods Store. This picture of the store was taken in 1882. Within a few years, the Globe Clothing Store was occupying this space. But Weeks would continue elsewhere and would remain in business for many years. By the first decade of the 20th century, he'd moved to Pratt Street, where he had a linen store in the Unity Building. Among the numerous Hartford businesses to occupy space at Number Twenty Three Asylum over the years, the most notable is a name still familiar today. From 1890 to 1894, this was the original home of Harvey and Lewis Opticians, which has occupied many locations in Hartford over the years, and currently has a store just a little further west on Asylum Street. Returning to the 1882 view of the building, back in the days when Weeks was at number 23, the sign above the adjacent door at number 25 reads "Evening Post." As I said earlier, R. P. Kenyon had used the entire building, but when that company moved out in 1880, the building's upper floors were taken over by the Evening Post Association. Publishers of the Hartford Evening Post newspaper. For the next few decades, in fact, 23 to 25 Asylum was known as the Evening Post Building. The publisher also erected a rear L for their press room and composing room. As I mentioned, the three buildings I've just been talking about were all removed when the 1929 Corning Building was constructed. Now I'll talk about the two buildings just to the west at 35 and 45 Asylum, which would become the site of Savitz Jewelry. By the time of this 1920s photograph, the building at 35 Asylum had a mansard roof, and the building at 45 Asylum had a prominent front-facing gable atop its roof. This is an earlier view of the south side of Asylum Street, back in the early 1870s. The view is eastwards, with the old State House in the distance. Back then, the buildings did not yet have their later, more ostentatious roofs. In their early years, these two were nearly identical three-story structures. Typical of the types of commercial buildings erected in Hartford in the early decades of the 19th century, while various kinds of businesses were located on this stretch of Asylum Street over the years, it was particularly popular with clothing merchants. In about 1884, Mulcahy's Boston One Price Clothing Store moved into the building at 33 to 41 Asylum Street. Within a few years, Edward J. Mulcahy had extended his store frontage to 51 feet and erected an addition to the rear of the building. For years, Mulcahy's was known as the Blue Store, presumably because it was painted that color. At the end of the 19th century, Mulcahy was recognized in the commemorative biographical record of Hartford County as having one of the largest clothing stores in the city. And being one of its best-known merchants, he was also on the committee of the Hartford Public High School, and was a member of the board of street commissioners. An item in the Hartford Current on May twelfth, eighteen ninety, even compared his fame to that of Lord Byron. Quote, Lord Byron, the poet, for the greater part of his life was unknown to the world. But as he afterwards wrote to his friend Tom Moore, he awoke one morning and found himself famous. So much so that he was obliged to go into the country to avoid the invitations and ovations that were being showered upon him. The present successful business venture of Mulcahy the Outfitter presents a situation not unlike that of the famous poet. 
being of a modest and sensitive nature, although doing a prosperous business, Mr. Mulcahy, a few weeks ago, was comparatively unknown to the public. But he has awakened as if from a dream to find the influx of customers for the unusual bargains at his store so great that he has several times during the past few weeks been obliged to do that which merchant has never before been known to do, lock his doors, being unable, even with his large force of clerks, to attend to the wants of so great a multitude. One of our reporters, passing the store at midnight last Saturday, dropped in and saw a sight to behold. Had a whole herd of elephants gone through the immense stock of clothing and furnishings, slashing right and left with their huge trunks, a greater scene of havoc could not have been produced. And there were the dozen or more salesmen, fagged and weary after the hard conflict, with only the consolation of victory. They were obliged to leave the stock as it was, being too exhausted to work longer, and also not wishing to encroach upon the Sabbath. In consequence, the store will be closed today, to give an opportunity to readjust the goods, realizing that Tuesday, Hibernian's Day, will bring another rush of business. Meanwhile, it would be well worthwhile to visit Asylum Street to see the beautiful and artistic decorations on the building's front. Unquote. In 1902, this Byronic merchant's store was acquired by C. A. Renneker, who sold Mulcahy's stock in a big half-price sale. Later that year, Renneker began making extensive alterations to the building. He had large plate-glass display windows installed on the first floor, tripartite windows on the second floor, and above he added a new mansard roof with projecting dormer windows. A little over a year after the renovations were complete, however, Renneker sold out to a new firm, the Sullivan Clothing Company, named for the ex-mayor of Hartford, Ignatius A. Sullivan. In fact, two years earlier, when he'd been nominated for mayor, Sullivan was working as a clerk at Renneker's store. He had risen to prominence as a labor union leader, organizing the Retail Clerks Union, and then serving as president of Hartford's Central Labor Union and the Connecticut Federation of Labor. He became the Democratic Party's nominee for mayor after his candidacy was promoted by a new organization called the Economic League, whose platform called for an eight-hour day for city employees, free textbooks in the public schools, and municipal ownership of the gas supply, among other measures. Sullivan was also Hartford's first Irish mayor. Sadly, after two years in office, he did not win re-election, but a number of his friends had a new project in mind for him. While he was away on a trip to Washington, they initiated the plan to purchase the Renneker store, where Sullivan had once been a clerk. Upon his return, the former mayor gave his approval, leading to the creation of the I.A. Sullivan Clothing Company, with Sullivan as president and his friends as stockholders. Less than two years later, though, the store went out of business, apparently due to the high rent on the property, demanded by both the owners of the building and by Edward J. Mulcahy, who sublet it. Sullivan's successor in the building in 1906 was known as the Connecticut Clothing Company. The following year, the company had to deal with the damage caused by two different fires that broke out within a few months of each other. Both of these fires originated with the company's upstairs neighbor. Back when Renneker had finished remodeling the building in 1903, a new restaurant opened on the second floor. It was called the Golden Grill and was operated by the Cooperative Catering Company. The restaurant's dining room featured a large grill, 
the establishment's advertisement in the Gears Hartford City Directory described its facilities, which included two private dining rooms in demand by theater parties and a cozy ladies' waiting room with a lavatory, much appreciated by the many shoppers who came to Hartford from suburban towns. Despite its extensive advertising, which took up several pages in the directory, the cooperative catering company went bankrupt just six months after the restaurant opened. The Golden Grill remained in operation for a few more years. A series of managers failed to make the restaurant profitable. On March 1, 1907, firefighters extinguished a blaze that had started in the Golden Grill's boiler in the basement but not before the Connecticut Clothing Company's new spring stock was greatly damaged by smoke and water. While combating the blaze, firefighters had to knock down shelves on the east side of the store that were blocking several windows. As the Hartford Current newspaper described it, the result was quite a mess. Just four months later, on July 4th, the company's stock was again soaked with water, after a fire broke out in the Golden Grill's storeroom. To help recover after each of these fires, the store held major sales of its stock. The Independence Day fire was described in detail by the Hartford Current. Quote, the fire for a time burned rapidly, giving out a lot of black smoke that was loaded with charcoal fumes. A stream from chemical number nine was turned on in the rear of the building, and a couple of streams of water were used for a few minutes. Soon after water was turned on, number three's leaky old hose burst in the alley east of the building, deluging a lot of the people and creating a small panic among the crowd that tumbled over itself to get out of the way. An additional chemical stream was also turned on from number two's auto wagon and between them the fire was kept from spreading into the adjoining rooms. Owing to the presence of about 50 bushels of charcoal, the smoke that first met the firemen was smothering, and it was impossible to get near the flames without crawling on the floor. Further excitement was caused by the hysterics of one of the waitresses, which were heard plainly above the din and created the impression that somebody had been caught in the rooms. The partitions were ripped away, and the burning debris was shoved out of the window until the alley east of the block was nearly blocked with furniture and broken crockery. Unquote. By 1909, the Connecticut Clothing Company had left, and its former retail space was subdivided. The section at 35 Asylum Street was occupied by a business called the Surprise Store, which manufactured all of the men's and boys' apparel that it sold. In May of 1914, one customer got a real surprise at the store. Arriving near closing time to pick up a suit that was being altered, he was told it would be ready in about five minutes and was handed a newspaper to read while he waited. When the suit was ready, the store's clerks didn't see him, so they closed up for the night, leaving the customer locked inside. He ended up having to call the police who notified the store manager, and the trapped customer was eventually released. Jumping ahead, in 1923, a branch of the chain of Kaufman Hat stores opened in the space. That store would remain there until 1936, when Savitt moved in. Over the years, Savitt would completely transform the building with a series of expansions. In the beginning, he did not occupy the entire structure, but in 1945, he expanded into the adjacent store, which almost doubled his retail space. He also installed a modern black glass exterior designed by the Hartford architectural firm of Kane and Fairchild. The current described the expansion as one of the first post-war ambitions to be realized in Hartford. This photograph from around that time is a view west across Main Street towards Asylum Street. It shows the old Mulcahy-Renniker building, still with its mansard roof, 
and now with a large neon sign for Savitz. In the coming years, the mansard roof and upper floors would be removed. Savit would also expand into the space occupied by the neighboring building at 45 to 55 Asylum Street. It had a prominent gable roof and at the time of this photograph was occupied by Kennedy's clothing store. This building had also been dramatically altered over the years. As I mentioned earlier, this building once looked very similar to the building just east of it. In 1884, the east half of the building's ground floor was occupied by the A. L. Foster & Company clothing store. In 1892, the store expanded after it secured a lease to the west half of the building as well. The following year, A. L. Foster & Company undertook a significant remodeling, creating a new two-story storefront that featured eight massive 10 by 15 foot sheets of glass, said to be the largest used in the country at the time. A. L. Foster and Company was part of the Best Syndicate, which controlled 27 clothing stores in New England. Such a large organization could do its buying at far lower prices than would be the case for an individual store. The Hartford Current described the store's interior on December 18, 1893, quote, The depth of this magnificent store is 116 feet, with two galleries additional, and it is 20 feet in height. The two show windows have a capacity greater than any store in Connecticut. Nickel frames are fitted to the windows and make a beautiful setting for such a wonderful accompaniment in crystal. The entire fittings of the store in wood are in cherry and ash. Two large mirrors 13 feet high and 8 feet wide with paneled mirrors at the top extending to the ceiling are at the front of the store. The frames are of carved cherry. The iron columns through the center of the store are surrounded by panel mirrors of beveled plate glass from floor to ceiling. Nothing is lacking to carry out the general idea of substantial richness and elegance in every department." Unquote. In 1896, the building was further altered. Large display windows were added to the third floor and a rooftop cornice displaying the store's name topped by a front-facing gable. Now, you may ask, did anything unfortunate happen to these windows over the years? Well, there's a story from 1910 of a taxi cab that got out of control, jumped the curb, and smashed one of the windows. But there's an even more dramatic story of mayhem from April of 1901, when an agitated mob broke one of the windows. What was the cause of this commotion? It was the store's distribution of free suspenders. Quote, As the street is a narrow one, and the crowd had to make space for the trolley cars to pass, it did not take long to make a blockade. The street in front of the store was packed long before the distribution began. Colt's band, after playing Hot Time, gave a concert inside the store, and when the doors were opened, the store was quickly filled by those who wanted to get suspenders for nothing, by those who wanted to see others grab for them, and by still others who wanted to hear the music. Frank Dunn of Broad Street, about 17 years old, was one of the first to get a good place, and after being in the thickest part of the jam for a half hour, he said it was a relief to get struck by the falling glass from the broken window, as then he had a chance to get out. The crowd pushed so hard that the window at the east side of the entrance was broken. Unquote. Dunn, who worked at the Underwood Typewriter Company, and two others were injured by the falling glass. Quote, Dunn had his cuts attended to in Dr. Bunce's office. The principal cut was on the top of his head, and this was sewed up. His arm and hand were cut in several places, 
and he was covered with small pieces of broken glass when he went to the doctor's office. Dunn said that he believed the breath would have been crushed out of him if the window had not been broken at the time it was. He said he was unable to move and was nearly exhausted, unquote. Fifteen policemen arrived but had difficulty trying to control the crowd, which numbered about 3,000. Quote, the police had to use their clubs to get the crowd back so as to rope off the walk in front of the store. This was found to be necessary to prevent the other windows being broken, unquote. The police also had a hard time trying to control the crowd inside the store. One officer had a razor blade flung at him. Quote, Sergeant Dietrich was inside the store, and he advised Mr. Foster to cut the distribution short. Mr. Foster started to make a speech in the store, but could not make himself heard. Then he spoke from the second floor and asked the people in the street to disperse. He said that the crowd was too big to manage, and about one-half of the free suspenders had been given away. Quite a number objected to the announcement and told Mr. Foster to throw the suspenders out of the window. The police made a path for the band, and they marched up Asylum Street. A part of the crowd followed the musicians and then returned to the store. The crowd was as large as ever at this time, and Mayor Harbison then addressed the crowd. He said that the fun was all over. There were no more suspenders to be given away, and he asked all good citizens to disperse so that it would not be necessary for the police to use force. This speech seemed to satisfy the crowd, and it quickly moved away." Unquote. After A. L. Foster's death, the building was occupied by a branch of the Kennedy clothing store chain, which initially painted the building white. In 1940, the store was remodeled with a new stainless steel front. Kennedy's remained in the building until it moved across the street in 1951. Shortly thereafter, the old Foster Kennedy building was torn down. At the same time, as I mentioned before, Savitt was dramatically transforming and expanding his own building. The picture on the right shows the area after about 1953. That was the year that Savitt remodeled his building and the old Foster Kennedy building had been replaced with a one-story structure. Eventually, Savitt would extend his store to include the property once occupied by the Foster store. This is the completed space that Savitt's would occupy until the store finally closed in 1986. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button. Also, please subscribe to the channel. And thanks for watching.